Uh, so we'll begin with our, our next talk. Uh, and it's by Cassandra Phillipson, and uh, some of you would have, many of you have probably met her uh, because she's been involved with the hands on training as well. Uh, so Cassie's a graduate student in our interdisciplinary PhD program in genetics, bioinformatics, computational biology, GBCB, which I mentioned earlier and of which uh, Adri is a part. Uh, and she's associated with NIML, the Nutritional Immunology and Molecular Medicine Laboratory, where we're working with Joseph, um, and also obviously associated with, associated with the MIT project. She got her BS in Animal Sciences from Virginia Tech. And she began working actually in Joseph's lab as an undergraduate, doing undergraduate research, and then continued with that now uh, as a graduate research assistant, which she began in January of 2012. And uh, even uh, though she's not been in the program nearly as long, say, Adri and, and some others in Joseph's lab, she clearly already has some significant accomplishments. Uh, as evidenced by a presentation here, uh, but also by two presentations that she gave at the AAI meeting in May uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and so the title of her presentation today is Modeling Epithelial Cell Responses. Well, okay, it's different than what I have, but that often happens, so you can read the title there. <laughs> that are really specific to what's going on in the network. And I'm not going to say this isn't time-consuming because I 
think you can tell by this morning, it's definitely also time consuming, but maybe more, um, you get a, a deeper, more rich network. Um, and then what we kind of do in the lab is more of a hybrid between these two. Maybe we use our, our data, we plug it into IPA, uh, which you guys will be having hands-on training this afternoon, and we get some top pathway hits, and we can add or subtract hypotheses and hypothetical reactions within those models. Okay, so you get these canonical pathways, and I know some of you have not been able to go straight into solid fiber, but hopefully between today and tomorrow you'll be able to do that. But this is kind of that, that look. It, this is still just a top or topography of your interactions, but now you're kind of giving some weight behind it. And from here, this is where we can import into Composite, as I hope all of you know. A big question when you create your model is what kind of data do we have available? What can we use to calibrate this? And actually, this is a huge deficit also in the literature, as Audrey has mentioned several times in his model, it's, or in his talks. It's really hard to find rich data over time that matches your questions. So you can uh, use both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, if you have questions about how you can translate some of your data again, please ask us. Um, but if you can estimate values and trends from qualitative data, go ahead and put you know, some fractions into an Excel database and use that to calibrate anything that you can get your model to start simulating the curves that you want. Okay, and also, and I'm going to emphasize that time course data is really excellent because that's most of what we've been using, but steady state data is really important too. And I've used a lot of steady state data to calibrate his model. So if you only have one time point, that's okay. You can put that into an Excel database and calibrate what's called a steady state model. And we can talk about that um, more one on one if you're interested. But you can ask questions like what's the difference between my, my steady state of an infected cell or an uninfected or treated and untreated. Where can you get your data? Well, you can generate it. Uh, you can also search literature. Um, there are public re repositories, and we've been using a lot of geodata because it's that high throughput data is very nice. You get huge databases of almost anything you're looking for in time course format and many times. Um, so I'd encourage you guys, if you don't have data and you're trying to make a model, go online and start searching for what other people have already done. Yeah. So, and um, we knew because the gene, geo data are not generated by one PI, so there's like a, a different platform. So do you consider any? Do you have a suggestion for normalization on different data sets? So I guess it depends on which file you want to use. I try. So a lot of the files that you can download are already pre, like they're pre-processing. You just have to be very careful and know what they they did. So there's a you do definitely need to be careful when considering the data from GEO. Does that answer your question? Do you I, don't, I don't personally pre-process anything. I try and make sure I grab a file that's already pre-processed and published in that, what they, whatever they used to publish. Okay, and then also, um, consider published models. Can you apply that to your own research? Can you take the CD4 model, download it, play with it from biomodels.net, and maybe answer some of the questions that you have? And then from there, you take your data and you're going to link it to your reactions in Coposi. And some of you, I know, are confused about Coposi, but for all terms and purposes, just imagine it as a big, very powerful, big calculator, okay? It's going to fit your data to standard curves, um, and you're going to be able to simulate time courses and perform knockout studies. So again, if you have questions uh, about Coposi, let us know, because I'm not going to go into those in detail. And again, I'm going to emphasize if you have data with you here this week and you want to know how to make a model or how to start thinking about it um, and generate calibration data, modeling <coughs> questions, please find us and ask us if you are still really unsure um, after today, this afternoon. Okay, so as I promised, I will be talking about modeling now. The first model is a epithelial barrier integrity model. So as Koi talked extensively about the epithelial barrier is extremely important in terms of antimicrobial responses, maintaining that integrity between you and your environment, etc. Um, so here is just a really brief or short cross-section of the colon, and you can see here I've zoomed in on one crypt, okay? And we're going to go through the process, if you don't know, of how we get epithelial cells. So in the crypt we have stem cells, 
And these stem cells are going to proliferate, um, well, and they're going to create what are called transient amplifying cells. And these are also highly proliferative, and they will differentiate into specialized epithelial cells. Um, so as you can see here in this diagram, we have proliferation, we have differentiation into epithelial cells, and we also have movement, because these are constantly going up into the crypt and shed out of the lumen after they die. And this is a really rapid process. So it's really simple. Um, here we can see this is a cell designer network. We start with stem cells, okay, and these are all uh, transition equations. So a stem cell will become a transient amplifying cell. That cell will then proliferate into this pre-epithelial <coughs> cell. The pre-epithelial cell um, is going to then differentiate into an epithelial cell. And I added this bug because this is what I work with, but uh, it's just a pathogenic strain of E. coli that can cause infection. But if we assume epithelial cells will die and they'll be shed into feces, we can start building a model off of this very simple uh, structure. Okay, so differential equations. I, I want to put this up here because it's, it's simple if you guys just start thinking about how you can assign rates and reactions to your model. And these are actually, this is part of what Coposi can do for you. So if you import the network I just showed into Coposi, you will get these kinds of reactions. Um, but this is what you'll see is that the change of stem cells over time, um, actually in this model, is fixed. Okay, so we're going to assume that stem cells are always there a healthy person they are, and we're going to fix it to a constant, okay, so that's the stem. Um, to generate amp the transient amplifying cells, we're going to have to take our stem cells and multiply them by some rate, um, but also some of those are going, so that's the increase in the TA number. The decrease in the TA number is going to happen when these cells differentiate into the next state, okay, and those go so on to the, to the dead cells. I'm going to show you how we can put some rates into this. So what we can assume is that stem cells, well, we know stem cells are a self-renewing population. And what that means is that uh, they will different or they'll proliferate and be able to maintain their population, which is why we can fix them to a constant rate in our model. And they divide asymptomatically, or sorry, asymptomatically, uh, asymmetrically to provide uh, one of these transient amplifying cells, okay? So if we fix this um, and we go ahead and make two, two more populations, which is already in the model, and we also assume that stem cells proliferate um, on the normal 24-hour cycle, and then we can start making rates, okay? So one stem cell to one transient amplifying cell in 24 hours, uh, we're going to get this multiplying mass action equation, and it's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. Not very exciting, but it's the first step in our equation, okay? When we get to our uh, transient amplifying cells, uh, these cells are going to be able to double, and actually these are pretty amazing. They can give rise to about seven generations uh, within 24 hours, which I think is pretty phenomenal. And this is where you would have to think of what type of reaction is going to best represent this. And I just used a population doubling, which is an exponential equation I'll show in the next uh, slide. But here you can see, again, stem cells are doubling all the way up to these gen generations where they will then become epithelial cells, or specialized epithelial cells. So if we uh, say that they can go even, well, 7 to 10 generations in up to 24 hours, um, and the normal, you can see here, what we can do is use just this exponential growth here and say that the time they spend doubling is going to be maybe about 20 hours. And this is, you're going to have to play with your numbers. But here we'll say, okay, if we have uh, the divisions over time, we're going to have about 20 hours they're going to spend dividing. And the doubling rate will say just on average, maybe every four hours, they're going to create a generation. And we can see here that this next rate is going to be um, up to two to the fifth. Okay, so differentiation, again, we have one epithelial cell becoming a pre-epithelial cell every two days. And so if we do some simple math, we get a rate of 4.5. Is everybody following me at this point? Okay, good. 
Um, finally, so epithelial cells will live for about five days. They'll die and they'll enter the lumen and be shed in the feces. Um, so again, we can say for every uh, five days an epithelial is alive, you're going to get one dead cell and you get this rate, this 0.2. Okay, so if you remember, uh, we have a constant uh, number of stem cells and on average per crypt you have about four biologically. And so our initial conditions for this model would be having four stem cells. And again, you can do this by hand and you can calculate it. You can also calculate it in Kobazi. Um, but you'll be able to generate then four transient amplifying cells, which is pretty intuitive, and then multiply through and figure out how many of each subset and phenotype you're going to have at any given time. And we create what's called a steady state model. And this would represent, actually, over time, it's not changing, but it is changing. You just have that constant layer um, present. So if you imagine in your intestine, you have about 5 times 10 to the 10 epithelial cells in your colon constantly there um, and being replaced. And this is going to represent just one crypt. And so we can scale up, scale down, etc. Okay, so I wanted to show you guys this very simple way to get um, a steady state. And steady state is important because once you know where your baseline is in your model, then uh, you can add maybe some infection rate, maybe some cytokines, and those are again going to add to the proliferation rates or um, infection rate. And you can see here, we can. In, I did a, just a very basic infection at time zero, um, and we, while well, we have infected cells going up, we have some cells dying. The proliferation rate increases a little bit, and our epithelial cell, our epithelial barrier. Um, we can determine maybe whether or not it's compromised or proliferated, et cetera. Okay, so now I'm going to move into some intracellular networks, uh, or one, because my research at that point, um, you notice I did add some IL-17 and antimicrobial peptides, and I became really interested in answering questions about how antimicrobial peptides are regulated in epithelial cells. And we created this really large network. I know this is intimidating, so I'm going to break it down a little bit um, for you guys. But this is assuming one colonic epithelial cell. And so I'm just going to go through the signaling uh, pathways that I think everybody saw this morning. We have TLR signaling. We have cytokine signaling, so receptors. Um, and also, they can produce cytokines. They can produce integrity proteins. We have NLRs and inflammasome components. Um, and also, something that I'd like to show you guys tomorrow or this afternoon in Cell Designer is uh, how you can represent the difference between transcription and translation. And this is important because depending on the data you have, if you have mRNA data, you need to be modeling transcription rates. If you have protein data, you can start modeling translation rates. And also, if you don't have those, we can talk about how you can fill those gaps in data. And this is important. I think people have been asking about post-translational um, and the post-transcriptional modification. If you have these reactions uh, inherent in your model, you can assume maybe you could modulate that one reaction and incorporate some of these uh, microRNA or mRNA degradation uh, reactions after you've created your model. So it does leave room to add those post-translational uh, reactions. And again, I, I'm very interested in post or antimicrobial peptides, so we have those in there. Okay, so it's a large network, and the first question was, okay, I have my network, where can I get my data? And the truth is, when I started uh, working on this network, there was almost no time for data on epithelial cells at all. Um, in, the ter in terms of time course, RNA-seq or microRNA large data sets, which is what I wanted to be able to calibrate. Um, there's an interesting paper, and I would encourage you guys to take a look at it, uh, called the Global Quantification of Mammalian Gene Expression Control. And what's interesting is they measured, uh, they globally measured mRNA and protein levels, and they started uh, hypothesizing, and I think relatively convinced that some of the mRNA transcription at, at just steady state levels um, are relatively uniform, and that that also correlates to their half-lives, um, which is, again, another rate you're going to have to juice the literature to get all that you can. Um, but protein translation uh, was interesting because it was 
most related uh, when the proteins had functional similarity. So maybe you don't actually know the measurements of your proteins, but if you can group your proteins together by function, you may be able to estimate some rates there. Um, so I was really feeling hopeless. <laughs> so I went on to GEO and I found uh, bone marrow derived dendritic cells and some raw macrophages that were simulated time course data with LPS. And I, I, was, I was just desperate for data. Sorry. And what I did was I just laid out some, I took all of the molecules from my network and I grabbed them from these geo databases and I just put them up on a heat map. And I wanted to know, okay, are these cells responding similarly? Because if maybe, if mRNA rates are similar according to this paper, um, maybe I can use a different cell type to start calibrating my model and get it in the right range. And if you, I know it's probably really small font, but essentially uh, all of these outlined molecules here had almost identical expression patterns over the first four hours. This study ended at four hours um, to LPS, which for me was encouraging. I know that there's definitely cell specificity, and I'm not saying um, that this is the end all say all, just calibrate your model with whatever. Uh, but this gave us some initial data to be able to get our uh, model into shape. Quick question. So these are uh, two geo data sets. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to, to your question. Sure. Like two geo data sets, and you took the already normalized data and looked at them. Is that what you're showing here? Yes. So this is a uh, full change data, but from the normalized file. Yeah. And do you know if they're normalized in the same way? Or the same platform or anything like that? Um, I know they were not on the same platform. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not sure of the normalization. And the, this fold change, the color code for the fold change is normalized by each gene or is not normalized by each gene? Um, the colors here yes. are, I guess it's global. So this, you can compare, is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes, so it's a global range. And red is up and blue is down. So, so even the scale is the same? These two? Yes. 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 Okay. Oh. I'm sorry. Try to go one step uh, before this. So you showed the model, uh, like the complex network that you yeah. showed. So my first question is, how do you build that complex network? Where you get the, is, the, is, is it already there out there in the literature, or are there any specific rules? So most of the pathways are very canonical from literature. And then I guess some of the inflammasome or the NLRs where we have no idea what's activating them or there are hypothetical reactions within the model, those are things that we have to assume. And we can, when we do our calibration, we can add or subtract reactions whether or not the data is fitting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are we good? Okay. So um, I used this data to do some initial fitting, uh, which is basically taking in Coposi, we take the experimental data and we want to put it with our reactions for that intracellular network and make them all match. Okay, so what you can see is we have experimental data in solid lines, solid gray or black, and then the fitting data, so whatever the model was able to generate, is in the color. Okay, and you can see this, this looks really good. And I would say that's because the data set was really rich and um, it had several time points as you can see before. <clears throat> okay, so when I get to this, uh, actually, Dr. Eubank put this up, and I'm going to re-put it up because I think it's really important. Um, but an approximate answer to the right problem is worth a good deal more than an exact answer to an approximate problem. So what do we ask our models? We can calibrate them, we can have these huge networks, we can get them into shape. But what, what do we want to do? What are we asking? So I'm going to try and start putting into context a project um, that we've looked at or that we're doing an ongoing now, and also show you some other work that I did that started with a question. 
Um, so one of the modeling questions maybe we could ask would be, how do alterations in the intestinal epithelial cell functionality, or the NLR functionality, alter T-cell differentiation, okay? And this is going to introduce maybe some multi-scale modeling that we're going to talk about tomorrow. But assume we have our epithelial cell model and it's calibrated, and we can overexpress or underexpress NLRs and grab some cytokine outputs. Um, these are, I would say, specific for TH17, and we link them up with Audrey's model and we use them as inputs. Okay, now we can make really fast predictions of what's going on between these two cell types. And I think we've also considered taking this to a population level, so we can add some randomness and some stochasticity and agent-based modeling to look at a whole T-cell population based on what's going on with NLR knockouts. And, and this is supported by literature because when you knock out NLRs, uh, there's a lot of, the, the steady state of those animals is not normal, okay? So uh, we would want to be able to see maybe what's going on there. Maybe another question um, would be how do T-cell phenotypes regulate antimicrobial peptide production from uh, the epithelial cells? And so from here maybe we would start with the differentiated T-cell and feed those inputs into our model uh, for the intestinal epithelial cell and maybe have them do a few cycles and go back and forth and see what's the steady state of all of these antimicrobial peptides and, and which phenotypes are regulating which. Um, so those, are, those would be some examples of questions. Okay, so the final portion of my talk is going to be about epithelial cell plasticity. And this was a course project that I was able to fortunately do for my, um, I guess Dr. Ben actually teaches the course this year. And I worked on a or process called epithelial mesenchymal transition. And this process is a dynamic process where epithelial cells um, undergo phenotypic conversion and become migratory. And uh, this, if you've heard of it, it's normal during embryogenesis and tissue remodeling. Um, I must say it was governed by a complex microenvironment. Um, and as you can see what it looks like. But when it is abnormal, uh, this EMT is at the initiation and invasive front of metastatic tumors, okay? So how tumors can get into your blood system and travel around. So we were interested in modeling this, especially um, because of, yeah, I think you know what metastatic cancer is, but 90% of all cancer-related deaths are caused by metastasis, so this is a, this is a big deal. Now, uh, traditionally, TGF-beta has been identified as a hallmark of this process, and it does that by signaling through um, some complexes that get into some transcription factors, uh, snail, zeb, and twist. And then these transcriptional changes will alter some of the uh, cellular markers that help adhere epithelial cells and keep them uh, in their right format. So there was originally a model uh, done by the group, and this is what it looked like. So they had the external TGF beta um, modulating the, these two proteins, uh, transcription factors, snail and gut. And then we had some microRNAs, 34 and 200, and then some cellular outputs. And uh, if you can catch it, there's a lot of feedback loops in here. So the analysis that the group performed on this type of model was really different from what you've seen us do um, over the past few days just running a time course. Um, what they did was they ran some, uh, well here would be a sensitivity analysis where they were able to perturb different uh, parameters and estimate how that change in that one molecule affects downstream. And Audrey had presented stuff like that that he had done on his. Um, and they also did some steady state analyses, and they were able to show that these feedback loops, um, different feedback loops, initiate EMT or maintain EMT and reinforce the mesenchymal phenotype. Um, and the model was published here, and I believe the validation data is uh, in revision almost in press. So uh, these actually were validated just by a simple model. Like a simple, like Big question, but a simple question. So the course project, we were interested in how does IL-6 
play a role in EMT. And there's one review article that actually puts IL-6 in the context of EMT, and I'm surprised as an immunologist not to have seen this before. Um, I haven't seen any experiments where people are uh, stimulating with IL-6 anti-GFBA to induce this phenotype. Um, but IL-6 was able to signal through the JAK-STAT um, signaling pathway and also activate all of these same transcription factors. Um, so we were interested in molecular crosstalk here, okay, how can IL-6 and TGF beta enhance each other in an autocrine manner and how can they um, regulate their downstream molecules or downstream transcription factors together. Um, there was this paper that came out, uh, I guess at the end of last year, it's really nice. Um, and it's important because the group took a whole bunch of different cell lines and characterized the phenotypes uh, present based on expression levels of these transcription factors. So what they found was in cell lines, ovarian cancer cell lines, they already exist at these four steady state phenotypes. So our question from this is, well, okay, if an epithelial cell can become mesenchymal, Will it go through all four of these phenotypes? Can we mathematically determine whether or not it's possible for four steady states to exist? Or are these the same? Or are they different? Also, uh, this paper didn't include the functional role of twist, and a lot of people are really unsure about that. So we want to use modeling to start understanding how twist is affecting some of the dynamics of the transcription factors. Again, these results were coupled with TGF or IL-6, so this autocrine that maybe, be, maybe can maintain these phenotypes that we're interested in. And then also, um, we already had a model that had TGF explaining some of these phenomena. We wanted to be able to add one more external cytokine and see if we can explain some of the other, again, intermediates or the uh, ones we're interested in. I'm going to skip over the motivation because I think you guys can understand it's important. Um, but I will point out really quick that blocking IL-6 alone has been moderately successful during EMT and cancer treatment, and also uh, anti-TGF beta treatments have been moderately successful. So the idea would be maybe if we can study how to link these two together um, and block, inhibit, or we don't know yet, um, but come up with some strategy to modulate both of these together during the EMT process, that would be great. So I've abstracted the model because it has a lot of interactions in it, but basically we've added this IL-6 uh, mediator here, and we can add it as an external cytokine, for instance, if we were simulating an in vitro culture, or it has its autocrine effects, and we still have TGF-beta. We have our three transcription factors and some feedback loops with microRNAs, and they signal um, to these already mentioned uh, phenotype, well, I guess cellular markers that regulate the EMT phenotypes. Really quick, I want this, we don't use this very frequently. I actually just happened to um, come across this uh, website when I was doing some of this modeling, but I want to emphasize that when you're coming up with your networks, you're going to have to be creative because if you're doing novel cutting-edge <coughs> research, those reactions are probably not written in, in literature yet. So you can use online platforms, um, you can use IPA like we're going to do to predict reactions and interactions between different molecules, but maybe also some binding, um, transcription factor binding websites that will predict, yes, maybe this uh, certain transcription factor binds to your target gene. So we did this and actually it provided really useful uh, for our model creation because IL-6 has not been described during EMT. So just get creative with how you identify predictive networks. Okay. And I guess I will finish with just some of the fitting so that you guys can see that it's successful. Um, here you can see, again, these are from the experimental data of uh, four different phenotypes, we were able to fit those, uh, well, we were able to calibrate using this data to get these plots out of our model. Okay, so snail, set, and twist. And we can turn that into a time course really easy. Um, so you can see some, start seeing some of these dynamics. And from there, after we had a calibration, we were able to uh, ask some questions which I've already brought up. 
Um, but we want to explain maybe do TGF and, and IL-6 together contribute to the four ENT phenotypes? Is it possible? Because TGF alone can only contribute to three according to our previous mathematical uh, assessment. We also wanted to know how do cell sensitivities change when we stimulate with both IL-6 and TGF beta? And that again is that mathematical equation. It's unlikely that if you trigger IL-6 alone and TGF beta alone, that when you trigger with both, it's going to be a linear like common combination, an additive combination of those two. So we're, we're interested, how do they compromise each other and get an output? Um, also, we want to know whether or not priming effects, so this would be maybe uh, in the context of if you got infected and you have uh, high pro-inflammatory rates um, of IL-6, and can IL-6, can that predispose you to further EMT development if you have TGF beta coming back later, so priming um, is a big question that we can answer with modeling. Um, and then finally, characterize some of the crosstalk mechanisms, and those are, again, a lot of sensitivities, bifurcation analyses, identifying steady states, and determining how these two molecules, when they're together or alone, uh, can alter the simulation of different, or of the plasticity between the cell phenotypes. So I will just show, these are some ex the experiments that we did. Um, these are all simulations, but just to kind of get you guys thinking, uh, here we can induce EMT just by adding TGF. Um, we can also play around and do an IL-6 knockdown, or we can go into the transcription factors downstream and say, well, is IL-6 important or is twist important? And we found that IL-6 autocrine effects are actually more important. Uh, we can ask, okay, are these reversible or not? And I know these graphs probably don't mean much to you, but again, the questions. Um, if, we if we add TGF and then we remove it, can these cells revert back to their normal state? And same with IL-6. And in the case of IL-6, we don't think so. Um, so these are in silico experiments that we would like to take into the lab and try and validate at this point. Okay, and with that, I'm going to summarize that I hope you believe computational modeling uh, can offer predictive power for generating hypotheses about biological questions. And it also, I think, is a powerful and efficient framework for testing hypotheses in a high throughput manner, okay, uh, between multi-scale um, or even intracellular knockdown systems. The correct questions are key. So have a question and generate your network. Uh, and finally, be creative when you're generating your network and assess across scales. That has to be a question. So I actually have two questions. Um, probably I missed something. On the very first part of the talk, when you described in the model that you uh, put in capacity regarding the uh, stem cells, proliferating mm -hmm. and differentiation and apoptotic. So you mentioned that apoptotic rate is uh, one fifth of the uh, differentiated cells. And then yet you show me that it's a steady model that it's still the same number of cells stay there. So from my perspective, unless you put some feedback inhibitory loop, it will be constantly growing tissue and it's rather a pathogenic model, not the steady healthy model. So that's one question. And second question uh, about fitting the data. So you put those graphs showing model data with the uh, actual RNA seq or whatever it was uh, gene expression data, <coughs> and you said they look pretty good. So for mathematical community, it, it's not an argument. So what kind of measure you use for uh, saying this is good? This is pretty good, this is bad, and <clears throat> what would be the, your advice for us? Uh, how, what measure to use and what special to use to say it's a good fit? And whether capacity actually gives this uh, comparison? Okay, so your first question is asking how do we have a steady state when we have constant death? We have much lower rate of death mm -hmm. as opposed to growing and so I guess that would be maybe if you look at the initial 
concentrations or the values, number of cells. So you, that proliferative population has about 600 or so cells that are constantly there. And if you start from zero, it shoots up really fast. So what you would expect um, why increases. Why it keeps dividing? So that would be, I mean, you want to create the steady state model. So steady state would be when nothing is going in or going out. And I think maybe what would the answer would be, in the beginning, the stem cells are a constant rate of production. So they're always there, so you're not going to run out of them. Likewise, every cell that's being simulated is going to die. So when they reach a plateau of mathematically, they're going to equal the, the difference between the creation and the death is going to be zero, that rate. They're not going to be growing anymore. But according to model, only one fifth of the cells are dying. The so, rest is uh, kind of there. And you possibly have some new uh, mm -hmm. cells divided and, and added to that population. So where is the inhibitory loop? How to you know make the control on the certain level? So that that I didn't see in anything in that model. Yeah, so I think that I'm trying to figure out how to Stuff is raising his hands so then you all. The thing is, you do not need a feed loop, feedback loop because the death is proportional to the number of cells. So if the cell, if you have constant input, at some point your proportional death wins against the constant production. But if we have like n number of cells produced and only one fifth of them dead in Time yeah, but the, the death is the death is proportional. If you get, if you have constantly pro, uh, ten cells producing, and one tenth of them dies, if you have hundred cells, ten die. But when you produce ten, are not constantly growing then. No, if you have ten death, ten cells dying, and ten cells produced, you are in equilibrium. Yes. Uh, yes, but I understand the rates are different according to the model. So we no, have much the, more the, 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 the form of the rates is different. The numerical value in that moment when you have 100 is the same. 10 get created, 10 die. So you are in a steady state. You are still have a turnover, but you are still in a steady state. It is not an equilibrium steady state when it, it is not an asymptotic dead state when nothing happens. You can have that too. In this steady state, the amounts don't change, but you still have production and death uh, balancing each other out. So there are different forms of states. And as for this uh, error estimation, do you do, you do this around C, as a C, or what, what do you use for measuring uh, your feet for the experimental work? In Kokrazi, it will create a lot of statistics, um, and I can show you after if you're interested in the exact but it will tell you how uh, different the estimated values are statistically compared to your measured values that you're feeding the input. So we, we measure based on how well it fits the curve statistically. And when you say actually that it is well fit, what, what's your criteria? What's your visual? I guess that you will do very estimation. What are the results you get? And I will show you that um, one of my the standard it's, it's the it's a percentage of a weighted error. So the closer is to zero, the closer the field value and the measure value are together. So for example, if you get I don't know coefficient that's 50%, I would assume that is a good parameter uh, or a good uh, estimation. I would consider that everything that fits generally and it's within a range of between uh, zero and five, that would be a good fit. So this is a number that once you put your experimental data into Propasi and run your algorithm, Propasi will give you, okay, I was able to fit your data uh, with this error. And now it's up to you to consider, okay, am I gonna go ahead with this error and consider that that's good, or I want to change some interactions in the model and try to run another algorithm. And from your experience, what, what do you use is a kind of tolerable error. I will never, I'll never go with more than five. Uh, uh, everything that's more than five percent, um, to me, that my model is 
like in some way. Because to my model, to me, it cannot be directly my semantic data. And this is beyond all stochastic consideration, right? It, it's That's an OE model, right? Yes, mm -hmm. OE. But then at the same time, for instance, if you're creating a model in your research and your data is very limited, um, you can have flexibility on how much you are you allow um, yourself on that error. For example, um, if I have a time course data, my error will be, I mean, in my consideration, I want to have it at zero point something. Because I know I have the tools to fit the model. If I have one time point, and not only not all the species of the model, then I may be more flexible. We're interested in the end in modeling the this is the last model, the end in modeling this biologic process. And then when you give us the results of the, um, some of the modeling experiments, you were able to show that some of the some of the, in, some of the um, inputs affected EMT. Um, but the but, but last question is, but EMT itself is a, a readout. What did you, um, maybe it is, but it's, what, how did, how did you determine that it affected EMT? Is it a set uh, that, that you have a quarter of genes expressed and you determine that that would likely affect EMT? So you're, are you asking for in vitro or the in, in, the model. in the model? Yeah, so we calibrated with I guess there were cutoffs in vitro of expression of cell markers, the NCAT here and NCAT here. And if they reached a certain level in our model, we said that they had transitioned into a different state. Well, let's thank Cassie again for being